next speaker is a bit taller than me, so I'm going to have to like work with this microphone like this for a minute. <laughs> okay, um, our next speaker, uh, she is the Assistant Professor of Psychology and Education at Columbia University. She's also written a book which is for sale at the merch table out there. So if you want one, and I know you do, please go buy it. She can sign it. She'll probably even write something cool in it or draw a picture. She totally will do that. It's called Atheists in America. And I think I might know a few of those here. So buy your book. Okay, so everybody, give a big welcome to Melanie Brewster. Um, thanks so much, Lauren, for that introduction, and thank you, Skepticon, for having me here. Um, when I first got the announcement for the invitation several months back, I was sitting in my office and I actually did like a jig and a heel click, and then immediately after I finished that, I was like, is this a clerical error? Did they invite the wrong Melanie Brewster? Because even though I've been really active in psychology conferences for the past decade or so, I've actually never been to an atheist con. This is my first one. So, yay! So I, I love it so far, and I've actually been wandering around kind of starstruck. I have like all the stickers from all the vendors. I just keep taking more stickers. I don't know what I'm going to do with them. I bought atheist shoes. I had bought a shirt. Like I'm really going all out and trying to embrace it. But um, I'm very happy to be here. So um, the title of my talk is Why is Psychology Silent When It Comes to Atheism? But before I get started, I just want to make sure to highlight that all the research that I'm going to talk about was done in conjunction with really wonderful students and colleagues at Teachers College Columbia, but also across the country. So just to give them a shout out there. Um, and normally, I don't use personal stories to frame talks. I'm a psychologist. We have to be blank slates. And that's kind of how we're conditioned to go. We give really boring, dry talks. But I was told that I should not do that. So I'm going to try and jazz this up with a little bit of a personal story. So please bear with me. Let's hope this goes OK. So here's a state that you might be pretty familiar with. It's the state of Florida, one of our, our favorite states in the US, probably. Um, and I spent nearly a decade of my life in Gainesville, Florida, which is, if you see this voting map, all the red, of course, is Republican. Gainesville is that little blue section that's Alachua County. And it is a liberal kind of mecca in a sea of really conservative, conservative places. Um, and northern Florida, I like to think of it more as southern Georgia. Um, but uh, yeah, in Alachua County is this democratic haven. And as an undergraduate, at the University of Florida and later as a doctoral student at the University of Florida, um, I was really focused on doing work that didn't fit into the cultural experience of Northern Florida. So I did work on minority stress theory. And for those of you that aren't that familiar with minority stress theory, I wouldn't expect you to necessarily be, it states that marginalized minority groups experience stigma and discrimination, and those experiences of stigma and discrimination in turn impact our mental health. And, and specifically, they're linked to experiences of depression, anxiety, lower self-esteem, body image, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of bad things come from discrimination. So most of the research that I did on minority stress theory was related to LGBTQ individuals. Um, and the research team that I was a part of as a doc student, I really felt like we were kind of on the cutting edge of this work. We really lived and breathed queer activism and advocacy. Um, but you have to remember that this was done in northern Florida. So this is a, a typical pickup truck in Florida. And so as I mentioned before, we're t essentially in southern Georgia. The climate here, I actually knew people that had wrestled alligators. Um, they have Confederate flags flown. They often have cast metal bull balls on the back of their pickup trucks, much like this one. And I mean, I'm sure in Missouri you see this too. This is not a common occurrence, um, an uncommon occurrence outside of the South. Um, but it's important to note that this part of the country is not known for being queer friendly. And we actually only had one lesbian specific venue in Gainesville. It was called Wild Iris. It was a feminist bookstore. It, it often smelled of patchouli and herbs. And there were a lot of books on magic, but magic spelled with a K. So just to set the scene. Um, and so long story short, the research team that I was a part of and the work that we were doing felt extremely subversive. Um, and we felt like we were kind of badass. We were pushing the boundaries. We were, you know, breaking taboos to, to talk back to Haina's um, talk. And to reclaim a term, we kind of felt like we were doing some social justice warrior work. Whoop, don't, don't punch me. Um, so the thing is that as social scientists in particular, it seems like there's always some me-search that goes into doing research. So if you look over here, that tiny, tiny heathen is me when I was little. 
And I've always been atheist as far as I can remember. I was raised in a Methodist household, but religion didn't really ever stick for me. And so I, even though I was and still am really invested in doing work with LGBTQ populations, I myself identify as queer, there was always a part of me that wanted to explore the connections between psychology and atheism. And when I was in grad school, I don't know if any of you remember this, one of the, the things that came out in kind of research on atheism were these feeling thermometer um, studies. So just to kind of refresh your memory if you don't remember these, a feeling thermometer study asks the national public to kind of rate various groups on their perceptions of how warm or how cold you feel towards them. So zero would be, I feel very cold towards them, they're yucky, and then a hundred would be, I really like this group, they seem cool and warm, whatever. So the studies that were coming out when I was in school almost always painted atheists as the group that Americans felt most cold to and of course Muslims too. Um, so hearing this and knowing that I was really kind of interested in minority stress and I was interested in stigma and discrimination, I'd done a lot of that work on LGBTQ populations, a part of me said, oh my gosh, atheists must experience minority stress. How could they not? They're such a stigmatized group within American culture. And this is something that I must research. I'm so interested in this. So, I spoke to my advisor, who was a really, really wonderful woman, saying this does not say anything poorly against her, and I told her, I want to do research on atheism and minority stress. And her reaction sounded something similar to letting air out of a balloon. It was kind of like a <laughs> And she said very kind of calmly and level-headedly, hmm, you're going to be on the academic job market soon, and I don't know if you really want to do that. And I, maybe I was being naive, but I was actually just stunned. I remember walking out of her office being like, did that really just happen? She's never discouraged me from researching anything. And here we are in Georgia South, Gainesville, Florida, and we're doing research on queer issues, and yet somehow doing research on atheism is more taboo. Um, so how are we, we're like, we're subversive, but we can't be that subversive. So. That led me to the question of this talk, and one that I'm going to kind of revisit throughout the, the remaining minutes that we have together, um, that I, I just couldn't believe that in psychology that there would be things that we couldn't talk about at this point. And again, this was really naive of me. So I obediently tabled my project ideas to look at atheism and minority stress. Um, it should also be noted that even though I was training to be a, a psychologist and a therapist, in that training, I never received any advice on how to work with atheists. I'd received a lot of training on how to meet the needs of different religious groups that I'd work with, but never, never atheist. Um, so it was really something that was never brought up at all in my graduate training. And, but while I was in grad school, I kept kind of digging on atheism and psychology because I really wanted to know what there was out there, what people were saying about it. Had anybody else written about it? And I assumed that as a graduate student, I was just not that good at Google Scholar, that I must have been missing something. Clearly, that the lack of stuff that I was finding was not indicative that nobody was actually talking about this. Um, and so as soon as I got my job at Teachers College Columbia University, the, one of the first things that I did was put in a book proposal to write Atheist in America, which again is outside for sale. Um, and I also started doing several large scale projects on atheism with my graduate students. And so one of the things that you do as a psychologist with, that you're kind of expected to do is go to the American Psychological Association Conference and present your work. So I did. So this is a shot from APA. This is from 2014 in Washington, DC. And the number of attendees that go to APA range kind of dramatically from year to year, but mostly it's around 14,000. So it's a big deal, it's a big conference. And it's the, the main one in our field. And this is, just for reference, this is the prior year, this is 2013 in Hawaii. It's a smaller conference because obviously who can pay to go to Hawaii, except people on the West Coast. Um, and here is a list of the different types of topics of presentations that were included. So in 2014, I actually called the APA main offices in DC to get this information, because sometimes it's not that clear. Typically, in an average year at APA, there are about 1,000 um, presentations. And these could be things like symposia, roundtable discussions, poster presentations. The vast majority of them are poster presentations. 
Um, and they're on a huge, huge array of different topics. So it can be anything from drugs to the hypothalamus to hair eating diseases to prisoner well-being to the DSM to mentoring to sports psychology. Really anything you can think of, psychologists are talking about and talking about a lot and presenting information on. So one of the, the kind of more prevalent topics that gets discussed is religiosity. So in 2014, there were over 80 presentations specifically on religiosity. Um, and there were also 60, over 60, on spirituality. Now I, I beg you, just kind of scream out loud, how many presentations do you think were on atheism? Okay, here's zero, one, two. The person that said two, I'm gonna put on my smart glasses because there's a number. Um, Yes, it was two, two presentations on atheism, agnosticism, non-belief, really any code word you can think of related to atheism, I searched for that, there were only two. And here, here's one of the two. You might recognize these people. I look like a proud mama bear. It's a really awkward picture, I apologize. But this is me and my graduate students and this is a, 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 a project that I'll talk a little bit more about um, more towards the end of the presentation, but it was the scale development project. So we were one of the two, and the other one was another poster by an undergraduate student that looked at attitudes towards atheism at her college. So, just for, for good measure, this is the prior year at, in Honolulu at APA 2013. This was the only presentation that year at APA 2013 on atheism, and um, you can see that it was a really, really popular talk. That arrow points to me. And they scheduled it at the most popular time for conferences where you put all the, you know, the best speakers, 8 a.m. in Honolulu. <laughs> and clearly that was a great time for attendees. And I should mention, you know, I, I debated whether or not I would say this, but I feel like I might as well. So I'm scheduled to speak at another main psychology conference, the National Multicultural Summit in Atlanta in January, and they scheduled my talk for 7 a.m. That is unheard of, that never happens. I've never ever even heard of there being a talk at 7 a.m. And I was just like, this can't, this can't be just a, you know, a coincidence, there's no way. Um, I should say that I had the privilege of talking at a discipline-specific talk within psychology, a counseling psychology conference, um, a couple years ago on atheism and integrating work with atheism, atheists into therapy, and it was maxed out. People were really hungry for this information. So I think that when people start, like, stop putting these talks at 7 and 8 a.m., people will attend, potentially, I hope. So it turns out, sadly, that my initial assessment of the climate of psychology as a graduate student was right. There is really no one doing this work. And I mean, we can think of a number of reasons for why this might be happening. It could be that as students, people are discouraged from kind of doing this work. Their mentors say, eh, watch out, you need to get a job, don't talk about atheism yet, you don't want to offend anybody. Um, it could be that because of that people are afraid, maybe people are just disinterested, maybe people think that atheists are mean and unapproachable and why would you want to give voice to them and their experiences. Um, so I, I didn't really know for sure. But I hypothesized that it could also just be a product of the climate of the United States. So we know that the US is very religious. Since 1992, when you poll Americans, roughly 80 to 90% report that religion is very important in their lives are important in their lives. And that does not, that does not change. It's been a stable number. Um, and it could also be that religiosity and God talk really permeates everything we do, whether we're religious or whether we're non-religious. So what we say to somebody when they sneeze, um, how we conduct our birth rituals, our death rituals, our marriage rituals, they all have God in them. What we say when we orgasm, oftentimes God is there too. We cannot escape it. So, um, with the millennial generation, I know we always talk about this, things are shifting in some ways. So we know that 40% of people that are over 75 attend church at least once a week, but we know that millennials, so people that are 18 to 30, only attend church about 12% of the time, so less frequently. However, I don't want you to think that because attendance rates of church are dropping, that that says anything to do with atheism growing, because it, it doesn't necessarily. 
So this is a kind of depressing conglomeration of statistics that I'm going to throw at you right now. But in 1937, 1948, 1989, 2008, when we regularly ask questions about belief in the afterlife, at each of these time points, 70% of Americans say they believe in an afterlife. So that has remained very stable, even though people are attending church less frequently. Um, what else do I want to say about this? I think that's it. So clearly, as psychologists, faith is very important to examine because so many of us as Americans are faithful. And psychologists have absolutely taken note of this. As a field, we are very, very interested in belief systems in general. That's kind of our bag. That's what we do. Um, and religiosity and spirituality are no exception. We're interested in those too. And so for the past 30 years, there have been so many studies done on religiosity and spirituality. So just to give you a sense, this is, this is the number. So if you do a quick EBSCOhost search, and EBSCOhost, for those of you that aren't kind of geeky academics like me, it's a research database that kind of pulls all the peer-reviewed scholarly journals across a number of different disciplines. And so it's kind of a searchable index, and you can put in keywords, et cetera. So my students and I, to prepare for another project, did just a really quick preliminary search on articles that had keywords related to religiosity, spirituality, and psychology, too. And that's the number that we came up with. So 480,000 articles. And this is a huge, huge, huge number. Huge. And this is not to say, I hope I'm being really clear on this, this is not to say that there haven't been historical issues and pushback on doing work about religiosity within psychology. There has been. Um, it wasn't always something that you could talk about openly, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit too. But clearly, within the past 20, 30 years, the grounds have been really fertile to do this type of work. If you see a number that enormous uh, in terms of peer-reviewed literature within the past um, 12 years only. So if you look at what this literature tends to say, and you sum it up with this extremely, extremely scientific chart here, you see on the x-axis commitment to faith, and commitment to faith is measured in a wide variety of different ways. It could be the number of times you attend church, um, how much you pray, how strongly you feel about God, and then on the y-axis, all things good in life. So the trend tends to suggest in this literature that more religious you are, more good things in life that will come to you. And just to tease that apart a little bit more, so religiosity and having more of it is linked with satisfaction with life, less depression, being less socially isolated, um, a number of really positive psychological outcomes. Um, and to give a quote by some of my favorite researchers, acclaimed authors, number crunchers, Robert Putnam and David Campbell, they wrote that all other things being equal, the life satisfaction difference between a non-churchgoer and a weekly churchgoer is slightly larger than the difference between someone that earns 10K a year and a demographic twin, so somebody that's completely equal to them on all demographic variables, that earns 100K a year. That is huge, 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 huge. Um, but we're not going to leave it at that, because clearly we are at Skepticon, and we don't necessarily take these things at face value. So we're going to break this down, because um, there are a lot of big, big issues with this research that hasn't necessarily been troubled to this point. There are a lot of concerns with methodology, how these things are assessed, um, confounds, lurking variables, all sorts of stuff. But there's an asterisk there, because that's going to be to be continued, and we will return to that later on in the talk. The thing I want to highlight, though, is that, especially for psychologists, it's important that mental health and kind of social science in general should keep in mind that atheists aren't necessarily a small minority. We are small-ish, but we're roughly comparable in size to many other minority groups in the United States. So in the United States, as I mentioned before, the nun rates are rising, so they're non-religiously affiliated, but we know that not all of those are atheists. In fact, most of them are not atheists. However, if we look at various surveys that have asked, do you actually identify as atheist or agnostic or a non-believer, we see that the rates range from about 4% of the US population to about 16. And that is a broad range, don't get me wrong. Those are messy statistics and I don't like them. They make me uncomfortable. Um, 
But those numbers are roughly comparable in size to other demographic groups. So if we look at Asian Americans, if we look at African Americans, if we look at people that are members of the LGBTQ community, these are kind of in the same range. And these are groups that are clearly important to us as a society, and they should be, and we're doing a lot of research on these populations. So why aren't we attending to the experiences of atheists? Well, a lot of the historic inattention to atheism within psychology is probably because there are a lot of problems in doing non-belief research. And this really awkward but lovely quote is one of my favorites by the research, British researcher Stephen Bullivant. Um, nobody can say this as well as an academic. So, estimates of the rates of atheist identification are notoriously unclear as the precise definition of atheism is both a vexed and vexatious issue. Awkward. <laughs> um, so essentially what he's saying there is that the prevalence of the rates of atheism in the US and other places too are notoriously fuzzy because we all know this here. There's really little consensus on who atheists are, what they believe, what they don't believe, what that means. Um, and recent literature is making this even more complicated. So there's a trend now within academia to talk about atheism as more of a spectrum. And I personally do not like these, these terms, but I'm going to use them anyway, because these are the ones from the literature. So you have strong atheists on one end of the spectrum. So people that are anti-theist, anti-faith, picture kind of Richard Dawkins here, strong atheism. Um, and then you have a weak atheist, <laughs> again, not my terms, people who are more unsure, skeptical, or agnostic. And the idea is that all these people are actually atheists, they just fall in different dimensions of the atheist umbrella. Um, but the issue is that if we as a community, community um, don't even know who we are and what to call ourselves, how can we expect these really persnickety social scientists like me to want to kind of crawl around in our own identity muck and kind of clean this up and talk about us and examine our lived experiences? Um, that's why I think a lot of people have been like, ooh, not going there. However, um, apparently I love identity muck, or I'm also maybe just a little bit of a masochist because I'm so drawn to doing this work and this is all I wanna do. Um, so fair warning for those of you that are um, maybe not as in favor of stats or numbers or not inclined to kind of talk about methodology, this might be a good time to take out your smartphones and send some text because I'm gonna go through some numbers quickly and I won't be offended, it's okay. Uh, and then you can kind of look back up in like five or 10 minutes and it'll all be over, I promise. Um, <laughs> But in order to get a better feel for what psychology has actually said about atheism, I needed to do a content analysis, and I did this with my research team at Teachers College, so it was a big group effort. And I know that this joke, the dreaded content analysis, is gonna fly over the heads of most people, because you're not extremely geeky psychology nerds. Um, but I say the dreaded content analysis because doing a content analysis is terrible. It is terrible, you should never do it. Just to give you a sense of what it entails, it literally means you put a, a time span into like Google Scholar, EBSCOhost, Academic Search Complete, any one of these academic databases, um, and you retrieve articles related to a specific topic that are hitting certain keywords. In this case, we did atheism. And so you get hundreds of thousands of hits, you, and then you sort through all of these things and you see what they're saying, and you code the articles on who, like, who are their participants? What methods did they use? What topics are they addressing? What journals are they in? It takes a long, long time, but we did it. Um, and so it's really no easy feat. But we did it because we really needed to get a sense of the very, very limited research that had been published about atheism. And we also wanted to get a feel for how people were doing atheism research and the quality of it and where they were getting their participants um, and the trends, what topics were being assessed. What are people actually saying? So this is the method that we used. We used the Academic Search Complete EBSCOhost database, which again, like I mentioned, it's just a way to access peer-reviewed journal articles. Um, and the search was limited to scholarly journal articles, not books, not book chapters, not dissertations, and things written in English because we're Americans and we didn't know any other languages, to be quite honest. And the initial search yielded um, 1,000, roughly 400 articles. And for comparison, we came up with similar searches and similar keywords for Christian and for Judaism. 
And the Christian search yielded 10 times that amount with about 15,000. And the one with Judaism related keywords yielded about 8,000 articles. So many, many, many more for these other groups, which, you know, is unfortunate, but also these groups have more members than atheists do. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. So I don't want to bore you with kind of too much of the, the process of how we culled down these articles, but I should say that we retrieved all the abstracts, we retrieved all the articles, we read through all of them in meticulous detail, and we sorted out ones that did not look at atheism from a social scientific lens. So if there was something on atheist in science fiction comics from the 1950s, you know, interesting, I'd probably like to read it, but not gonna tell us about the atheist experience in psychology, so we did not code those. We also were interested in atheism within the United States, because we all know the US is kind of this wacky mush pot of anti-atheist attitudes compared to many other countries. So we limited it to articles that were focused on the US and had a US-based sample primarily. Um, and again, this left us with initially 1,400, but when we culled through, we were actually left only with 100 articles over a 12-year period that fit this criteria. And for those of you that aren't kind of geeky ac academics that know about content analysis, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny number. And you know me, I did a, like a heel click for joy because that means less coding on our end, but it also is really sad that there has not only been this little work done relevant to atheists in America. So, this is a, a chart that has the number of articles per year that were published. So if you look at the top number, 2001, you can see that zero fit that criteria. And then if you go down to the last row, 2012, you can see that 20 were published. And it's important to note that 9% of the articles were actually um, published during or after 2008. So that's a huge increase. So this clearly suggests that social scientists are starting to acknowledge that we're an important part of the population and we should be doing research with atheist um, community members. Um, in terms of type of article, most of the studies were non-empirical. And what non-empirical means is that there was no data that they collected or analyzed. So their theoretical pieces, their opinion pieces, their editorial, stuff like that. Um, some of the articles, so less than 50%, were empirical, meaning that they had data. But most of these were cross-sectional, not surprising, and cross-sectional means that people were surveyed at one point in time. There aren't longitudinal studies. But when it comes to belief systems, having mostly cross-sectional studies are, is really disheartening because we all know that beliefs kind of change and evolve over time. So you would hope to have more longitudinal studies when you're talking about something like belief or non-belief, um, specifically atheism. So if we looked at empirical studies a little bit more closely, one of the things that came out and really stood out to us was that 52% of the empirical studies, again, studies with data, um, use convenience sampling. And that's, that's something that's common in psychology. It's something that as psychologists, we all kind of roll our eyes at and hate, yet we keep doing. But essentially, convenience sampling means that you could be a psychology professor and say, hmm, I want to do a study. Oh, I have a whole captive audience of undergraduates that want bonus points. Here's a survey. Please take this. So it's the most convenient way to get participants. The other main way that people, it, the researchers conducting these atheist studies, um, got their sample was through secondary data analysis. And that means going to sources like the General Social Survey, um, like Pew, like Gallup, and saying, hey, you've asked these questions. Can you give us your data so we can poke around in them? But the problem with that um, is often that these questions are just poorly worded and they're not necessarily developed to ask about atheists. So you get a lot of kind of fuzzy data when you try and do atheism research from these sources. Um, so sampling already is problematic, but the thing I want to kind of hammer home to you all is that there was such extremely poor presentation of participant information, so demographics throughout these studies, and it was unbelievable how much of this demographic data was unreported. So just to give you a little bit of an example, um, so 23% of the studies didn't actually report the gender of their participants. 97% of these studies did not report the sexual orientation of their participants. 60% roughly did not report the race of their participants. 74% didn't give a mean age. 51% didn't include educational level. So who are these people that were included in these studies? We don't really know. 
These studies don't tell us that much. And if we wanted to replicate them, shit if we'd know how to do it, right? So why is this so sloppy? Well, there is a major publication bias against publishing articles on atheism. Journals are, tend to be afraid to do it. It stirs up a lot of controversy. And so most of these articles, unfortunately, were not published in kind of the best peer-reviewed sources. Um, because those kind of top tier journals would expect better and they'd make you report that stuff. Um, also, we know that from the few studies that actually did report this information, the vast majority of the studies were conducted with um, white heterosexual men of higher education levels, kind of like um, what we'd expect for atheism research. So, <laughs> not, not meant to be a joke, that's just how it happens in this research. Um, that's who wants to take surveys. So if you ever see a survey on atheism, and you are not a white heterosexual man, please take it. We need to hear your voices. Um, and as I mentioned before, the non-empirical pieces, which were most of the, the articles we reviewed, 74% were theoretical. So people being like, hey, I think atheists are like this, and kind of putting forth um, a theory related to atheism. So bear with me. In terms of topics that were discussed, um, both the non-empirical and the empirical studies, so studies with data and studies without, tended to address roughly the same topics. And these tended to cluster around a few different areas, the first being um, how atheist people are similar or dissimilar from religious and spiritual people. Second tended to be around topics such as bias towards atheists, how people feel about atheists, anti-atheist attitudes, et cetera. Um, but there were very, very few articles that specifically and only focused on atheists. Um, and so what this says to me is that researchers up until this point aren't really that interested in strictly our own lived experiences. They aren't asking about atheists and relationship connections. How are atheists doing at school? How do atheists value social support? Those sorts of questions aren't being asked. They only ask about us in connection with religious people, which again is kind of problematic and disheartening. So, let me get this over. So we know that there were 100 articles in a 12-year period compared to hundreds of thousands of articles on religiosity and spirituality in a similar 12-year period. And we clearly still need to have studies that link atheism with psychological outcomes, personality outcomes, and we need just rigorous and better literature. Um, and the fact that good peer-reviewed psychology journals are kind of hesitant to take studies on atheism. I know. I mean, I try to get stuff published and it eventually gets in somewhere, but it's not always the best place. And as a field, psychology has still said almost nothing about atheists. And the fact that we've said almost nothing still sends a really clear message, right? So as a field, we really need to break our silence and start to embrace work with this marginalized and also sizable population. But I realize that that still hasn't answered this question, which is the topic of my talk. So why has psychology been silent when it comes to atheism? We know that we are. Why? Well, it could be atheophobia, and this sounds a lot like arachnophobia. It's a really awkward word. But we, we know that from the few studies that exist, ran, there's really rampant stigmatization and discrimination that atheists face. They're a really marginalized population. It's very, quote, taboo to kind of come out as atheists. So maybe as psychologists, as a field, we're also kind of not above kind of engaging in these same attitudes. But I wanna challenge social scientists who may be in the audience as a field, psychologists, social workers, all of us are interested in the experiences of groups that experience stigma and discrimination. We're fascinated by it. We really want to understand these experiences. So if atheists are one of those groups that are experiencing all of these things, why is there hesitancy to include atheists inside this broader kind of multicultural umbrella to kind of weave us into the diversity discourse? That's very interesting and kind of troubling. So when I see this slide, I can't help but think of like act up, silence equals death. Um, so it could be that the inattention to non-belief in social scientists suggests that again, as researchers and scholars, we're not above holding these prejudicial attitudes. And again, non-believers are not a small minority group, we're a sizable minority group. Um, and don't we wanna know how people without any religious beliefs, people that are atheist or agnostic, 
um, go through life, how this portion of the population lives, how we love, how we form connections, um, how we, again, make it through school, how we deal with stress, how we teach, um, all of these things. We need to know answers to this. We don't have answers to this. And honestly, at a utilitarian level, it kind of baffles me why religious scholars aren't tackling this too, because you would think that religious scholars would be really interested in non-believers and how they got there and how they reached that path so they could save us. But again, who knows? Maybe they don't need to do that research. But it's important to note that it has not always been this way within psychology. There have been really dramatic shifts in the past 20 or 30 years. Um, and beyond that, there have been really dramatic shifts within society towards religiosity and atheism too. And many of you are probably well aware of this, but I'm always stunned to when I interact with people that aren't aware of this. So I'm just gonna throw out a couple of statistics. Um, so in the 1950s, that's the first point where in God we trust and under God was added to our currency in the pledge. And it was added by President Eisenhower and Congress in response to the perceived communist threat in the 50s. And it wasn't just a communist threat, it was an atheistic communist threat. So the idea was that if we kind of beefed up our attention to religiosity as a nation, that this would be a way to protect us from those evil atheist communists. Um, this was also the time frame where Judeo-Christian was a term that started getting used more often. Um, I've heard and I've read repeatedly that it actually didn't exist before then. And that phrase was created to kind of say, well, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe something, we're all similar. So Judeo-Christian, woo, at least you're not atheist. Um, so again, atheism went from being kind of this personal, or I mean, religiosity went from being kind of this personal system of belief to something that was more of a civic duty. Um, and it was an obedience and it was a convention that you had to follow. So religiosity got brought into the public in the 50s. And within psychology specifically, we have a very, very complicated history with many things, but specifically with atheism and religiosity. The founding fathers, and I use founding fathers intentionally because very few women um, were psychologists at the time that, atheist, uh, that psychology was getting started. Um, many of them were very much non-believers and a few of them were actually anti-theist. Um, evidence part two, studies repeatedly support that psychology professors are the most atheist and least religious of any other American professor group. So psychologists ourselves, this is kind of like some internalized hatred, right? We're very atheist, but we're not doing these studies. We don't want to go there. We're not going to do any studies on ourselves. Clearly, they are not invested in research like I am. Um, and then in the 1980s within psychology, something really shifted. So I'm going to take you on a, a journey through history, which hopefully will be as interesting to you as it is to me. Maybe not. Um, this is a quote from Sigmund Freud, who we know is kind of the founder of the field of psychology. Um, and we also know he's a little wonkadoo, so we'll forgive him for that for now. But this is what he said. He said, religious ideas have arisen from the same needs as have all other achievements of civilization, from this necessity of defending oneself against the crushing superior force of nature. Therefore, religious beliefs are illusions, fulfillments of the oldest, strongest, and most urgent wishes of mankind. As we already know, the terrifying impression of helplessness in childhood aroused the need for perfection through love, which was provided by the Father. Um, thus, the benevolent rule of a divine providence allays our fears and the dangers of life. Okay, so yes, Freud had some kind of outlandish, again, to use the word wonkadoo, attitudes. Um, and he came up with things like the Oedipal complex and the Electra complex and things that we all kind of roll our eyes at now. But really, the psychology would not exist if it wasn't for him. So we also have a lot of credit to give him. And essentially what he's saying in this quote is that, yeah, religion's important, it permeates everything, but really it's a coping mechanism, it's not real. And so that was the attitude for many psychologists for most of the 20th century, because they were all trained under um, psychoanalytic kind of training techniques. So you might say, eh, Freud, whatever, we don't want to listen to him. I hear you. So this is a quote from Albert Ellis. And Ellis is kind of a heavy hitter. And I know people don't like him because he was very vulgar. He said lots of bad words. I'm sure here it'd be fine. Um, but Ellis, along with Aaron Beck and a couple other people, are thought to be kind of the founders of what we now know as cognitive behavioral therapy. And 
For those of you that know anything at all about psychology, CBT is the main method that we use to treat clients at this point all over the country and it's spreading throughout the world. And CBT essentially says that your thoughts shape your emotions and your thoughts shape your behaviors. So if you change your thoughts, you can change your emotions and behaviors, right? Smart, we all kind of buy into that. So this is what he said about religion. This is a quote by him. Human disturbance is largely, though not entirely, associated with and springs from absolutistic thinking, from dogmatism, inflexibility, and devout shoulds, oughts, and musts, and that extreme religiosity, or true believerism, is essentially emotional disturbance. Whoa, yeah, that is a really strong view against religion. <laughs> really strong. And so, you know, he was very vocal. He was a very expressive guy. A lot of people said, shut up, Albert Ellis, you're kind of making us look bad. But again, it was okay that he said this. This was published in a peer-reviewed journal in the 80s. So the fact that you could say something like that in psychology shows just how far we've come. And so what happened? Well, in 1980, everything shifted when an article was published um, in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology by Alan Burgeon, also known as Brother Burgeon. Brother Burgeon was a really, really prominent, is it, because he's still alive, is a really prominent Mormon psychologist and really a research heavy hitter. So he's no joke, and I wish that he was because I'm really angry at him for doing this to our field, but he has published hundreds of articles. He has really, um, interesting research techniques. He really wants to kind of further psychology. He has good intentions. But in this article, he essentially argued that science had lost its authority as the dominating source of truth. Um, he also said that modern times are responsible for kind of spawning anxiety um, and depression, and that people are not, their needs are not being met by these secular um, approaches that we had within psychology. So non-religious approaches continue to fail us. And he argued in the 1980 that psychologists needed to work to examine more spiritual forces that were at play at human well-being. So bring spirituality back in, it's been absent for too long, was this take-home message. And as a result of this, the floodgates opened. Many, many, many scholars started doing this work. And so remember this chart? This is all the research that kind of came from that time until modern day. And all this research tended to suggest that greater commitment to faith, greater religious beliefs, would be linked to all things good in the world. And that's the way it stayed. But if we look at this more closely, commitment to faith should really be read as less religious to more religious, not atheist to religious. And that's gonna be an important distinction. So it really wasn't until the early 2000s that researchers got either bold enough or pissed enough to start talking about this pattern and breaking it down. So this is a snippet from The American Psychologist, and The American Psychologist is kind of our main journal in psychology. It's the most prestigious one. And this is by Kieran Davenport. They said, the biggest problem with this line of research is that the writers did not seem to provide safeguards that would preclude the general public and the press from taking these conclusions out of context. Such research could be used to support prejudice and discrimination. If one subscribes unthinkingly to the theory that those who are religious are healthy, it is not a far stretch to flip around logic into a theory that those who are unreligious are unhealthy, sick, or otherwise impaired. And that is exactly what happened for decades in psychology. It's to the fact that it was taboo to even bring up atheism or talk bad about religiosity. Because if religiosity was thought to be kind of a key source of mental health, why would you want to say anything bad against it? However, this line of research was really asking the wrong questions in the wrong ways. And so most of these studies use something that we call a Likert scale within psychology, where they ask you to rate various questions from uh, low to high, so not very true of me, to very true of me, not that often for me, very often for me. And they would ask questions about kind of faith, prayer participation, church attendance, spiritual activities that you do with others. Um, and the issue is that while high scores actually probably do indicate more faith, low scores don't necessarily indicate atheism at all. So if you don't attend church, you aren't de facto atheist. Um, and many atheists were systematically excluded from these studies because they would drop out. Now, I just want to ask you to think about this. If you were participating in a study about prayer and it asked you how often you prayed, and the only option was not often, 
probably you'd say, this is some bullshit. This is not capturing my experience as an atheist. I'm not going to take this study. Um, and most of these studies had nowhere to self-specify if you were atheist. So they weren't examining atheists at all. Yet they were being used to say that being atheist is bad and will make you unhealthy and unhappy. So here's this chart again. And what happens when atheists are actually included in this chart? Well, it turns out that there are a few studies that show that it's starting to change really dramatically. This pattern does not hold when atheists are included. And again, this is a, a small crop of recent studies. They're good studies, though, by social scientists that have very intentionally included atheists along with religious and spiritual people. And so when atheists are actually included, this relationship becomes curvilinear. And I'm going to break down what that means for you. It looks something like this. And so what matters instead is the degree of certainty of your beliefs rather than your beliefs themselves. Atheists look extremely, extremely similar on mental health outcomes as do religious people. They look very similar. Instead, the people that actually have less all things good in the world regarding their mental health are people that are more unsure or fuzzy on their beliefs. Um, so people that are kind of trying to discover themselves, to find themselves, those are the people where we see more mental health concerns. And in a lot of ways, this makes sense because we know that a stable worldview, no matter what your stable worldview is, is linked to better mental health. Um, so this is something that when you hear that, oh, atheist, it's unhealthy, you can fire back with data like this now. We know that it's not. We're actually very similar. But there is one thing that can actually impair the mental health of atheists and has been linked to distress. And that takes us full circle to minority stress theory, again, which is my original passion. And that is when you have experiences of stigma and experience of discrimination, those can impact mental health, and they do for atheists as well. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to go too into this, but my students and I did a large-scale study, some of which many of you might have participated in, because we had um, over thir uh, 1,300 participants. And we tried to break down the type of discrimination that atheists faced. And it turns out that there are a few different dimensions of it. People thinking you're immoral, people saying you bring shame to your family, people asking you to pretend that you're religious, um, being ostracized and kind of shut out of social circles, and then severe discrimination too, like not getting a job because you're atheist or getting fired because you're atheist. And so we, we gave a measure that assess these different dimensions, and we asked people to rate how frequently these dimensions occurred in their life. And what we found was that discrimination faced by atheists, this is the first time this has actually been looked at, actually is linked to mental health outcomes for atheists. Each of these dimensions, and the more frequently you occur them, is linked to a higher level of psychological distress and more loneliness. And these findings, I think, were surprising for many people that I've talked to them about. Because a lot of people say, well, why does it matter if religious people think you're bad or evil or moral? They're stupid. They believe in a, like a big sky monster. We don't care what they say. But when it comes to discrimination and the people that have these negative attitudes towards you or your friends, your neighbors, your family in some instances, it does matter. It matters a lot. So discrimination does impact us and impacts our mental health. And this kind of fits into the larger minority stress framework and what we know about other marginalized groups like people of color, like LGBTQ populations, and like other kind of stigmatized religious groups. Oops. But the good thing is that we do know that there are certain buffers to this link between discrimination and poor mental health outcomes. And one of them is community building. And I know that when we hear community, a lot of people go, eh, we don't want that, we're atheists and we are independent, we don't need that. Um, but it can be really positive for our mental health. And it's been shown to be linked with um, you know, positive health, mental health outcomes for many other marginalized groups. The downside is that religious congregations within the United States are the most common form of community. And oftentimes, religious congregations are the only form of community that anybody has any connection to. And attending a religious congregation is linked to a number of things. Religious people who attend churches actually do more civic engagement. They do more things to help our neighborhoods, our youth, our health organizations, art and cultural groups. And people who attend church regularly as a part of their community actually donate more to secular causes than secular people. So you are a culture of do-gooders that actually do more good 
for secular people if you're religious, which is hard to take in and really awkward. Um, so the question that I want to ask you now is, knowing that there's research that supports that community is good for people that experience stigma and discrimination, people like atheists, wouldn't it be nice to have an atheist community? And I know this isn't a new argument, and a lot of people are doing this. There are people across the country that are starting to do this, um, and cultures like, um, or communities like ethical culture that have been around since the late 1800s. Um, but if you had a community where you knew people cared about you, where they could pick your kid up from school, where they could bring you flowers in the hospital, all these sorts of things would make the day-to-day -day lives of atheists much better, much happier. And as I mentioned um, earlier, so you all know that I, I wrote a book that's for sale outside, and I really feel like one of the participants summed up the need for community better than I ever could. So I want to read a quote from her. This is a quote from Pam Zerba, and she's active in the atheist community in Pennsylvania. Um, and she said, people who join the Pennsylvania non-believers will often talk about how free they feel, how wonderful it is not to have to edit what you say to others, or what you say, um, to hear others say all the things you've thought. It's not that we're obsessed with religion and talk about nothing else. Even when we share stories about our kids or swap recipes, that internal editor doesn't have to be switched on. And that is an enormous relief. It is our intellectual home and the place where we can be ourselves without apology. So, what I want to leave you with today is the fact that psychology, the, the branch of study that's responsible for our mental health as a culture, um, has largely ignored atheists. We know that. We have the data to prove it. Um, and if psychology isn't going to pay attention to non-believers, if psychology isn't going to do the legwork to do the research that we need um, to be happy and healthy, and if psychology is not going to explore us as a unique group, we as an educated group that is really invested in our own mental health, our own well-being, really need to take it upon ourselves to do some self-care. And not in that woo-woo self-care way, but real self-care that we know is empirically backed and will work. And so we don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel here because we know that community building works. It's worked for other marginalized groups throughout history. It always works. Um, and it's going to work for us, too. So we need to build that community. And we need to build it brick by skeptical brick. So that is it. I think I'm right on time. Thank you. Yeah.